<laughs> I'm Ann Walters Robertson, Dean of the Division of the Humanities, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to Humanities Day and to this year's keynote address. I trust today will be intellectually engaging for you, providing you with new, innovative ideas and increasing your knowledge of and passion for the humanities. Since 1980, we have congregated every third Saturday in October to share with you our in-depth research and insights into the humanities. And each year, both loyal and new fans choose to attend because they are intellectually curious, eager to learn more, and recognize that our contributions to civilization matter. Our scholars' ongoing studies enrich the natural domains of the humanities, the arts, languages and literatures, philosophy and linguistics, for all of humanity. As our faculty members expand the basis of our knowledge of ourselves, our past and our future, they are applying their skills as practicing humanists in unexpected places and ways. For example, installation artist The Aster Gates is bringing new life to crumbling urban neighborhoods. Rather than promote and carry out gentrification, he works with investors and builders to renovate one vacant building at a time on the south side of Chicago. As a result, The Aster Gates is creating tangible ways in which culture will continue to thrive for existing residents in those neighborhoods. In the music arena, Augusta Reed Thomas is introducing a brand new opera later this month in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The opera, called Sweet Potato Kicks the Sun, combines traditional opera with beatboxing. Augusta is building new links between traditional opera and contemporary music. Her original story will draw new audiences to opera, helping to keep the art thriving. In cinema and media studies, Allison Nadia Field recently identified a newly discovered silent film from 1898 called Something Good, Negro Kiss, directed by William Zelig and starting, starring vaudeville performers St. Subtle and Gertie Brown. Since Allison's identification, this film has been named to the National Film Registry. And this very afternoon, Allison discusses how this film is prompting a rethinking of early film history, especially the relationship between race and performance. And to satisfy your literary curiosity, James Chandler, who delivered the Humanities Day keynote address in 2016, examines four of John Keats' famous odes, Ode to Psyche, Ode to a Nightingale, Ode to a Grecian Urn, and to Autumn, from the vantage point of what is now 200 years since these odes were published. He asks probing questions about what entitles these poems to their claims of greatness. In her own Ode to Philosophy, Agnes Callard looks at what distinctive good public philosophy can achieve. And during all these Humanities Day sessions, you will see how asking the right questions furthers our understanding of our own humanity. This pursuit of knowledge and meaning never ends. Our journey with these scholars who interpret human experience builds on the solid foundation of the humanities across time and cultures. The multiple presentations you will hear today illuminate the paths of many UChicago humanities scholars. As part of this yearly celebration of the humanities, we select an outstanding faculty member to deliver a keynote address based on her current research. This year, it is my honor to introduce Jacqueline Nujama Stewart, professor in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies and the College and Director of Arts and Public Life at the University. She also directs the Southside Home Movie Project serves as the Turner Classic Movies host for Silent Movies Sunday and on the National Film Preservation Board, and she is co-curator of the LA Rebellion Preservation Project at the UCLA Film and Television Archive. Jacqueline earned her bachelor's degree from Stanford University 
She came to the Midwest and the University of Chicago to earn her master's and doctoral degrees in English language and literature, studying with renowned University of Chicago cinema scholars, Tom Gunning and Miriam Hansen. Following her graduation, she joined our faculty, specializing in African-American cinema and silent film history. During the past year, Jackie researched the racial politics of moving image preservation at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. She is now completing a study of the life and work of African American actor, writer, and director Spencer Williams. And she is the author of the 2005 book, Migrating to the Movies, Cinema and Black Urban Modernity. Jackie's work to preserve more than 200 home movies shot from 1929 to 1982 is the focus of the Southside Home Movie Project and its online digital archive. Jackie founded and directs this project, which collects, preserves, repairs, and digitizes home movie collections, including those of her own family who lived in the Princeton Park neighborhood in Chicago. These home movies are unique documents of cultural and social history, which but for Jackie's tireless research would remain invisible or even lost. The movies record birthday parties, family holidays, picnics, and parades. These scenes activate memories, crucial knowledge, and expertise that too often goes unrecognized. In addition to capturing these precious visual artifacts, Jackie has recorded oral histories from the families. Through the online archive of an active and an active program of screenings and exhibitions across the South Side that she has created, this history is available to students, teachers, researchers, artists, and filmmakers now and for the future. <clears throat> Jackie's keynote address today, entitled Home Movie Day, Personal Archives Lost and Found examines how analog personal archives can teach us about how we can both create and lose cultural memory. Please join me now in welcoming my ever creative and engaging colleague to the podium, ladies and gentlemen, Jacqueline Najuma Stewart. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Ann Robertson, who's just an extraordinary dean, um, for all of her support of all the faculty in the Humanities Division, for the field of cinema and media studies in particular, and also for my research, which, as she indicated, often spans off campus. So thank you, Ann. Um, I was thrilled to receive the invitation to deliver this year's keynote address because there was this beautiful alignment of the stars, of the days. Today is Home Movie Day, <laughs> in case you didn't know. Home Movie Day involves an international network of events this year in 34 countries, 32 programs in the United States, including a program we're going to be doing here at the Logan Center for the Arts at 1 p.m. featuring home movies. People bring in their reels, they're inspected on site by archivists, and then they're screened if they're in good enough physical condition to be screened, and the families are invited to narrate the footage. Home Movie Day was established in 2002 by the founders of the Center for Home Movies, a group of archivists who are working to help communities, in their words, discover the personal, historical, and social importance of home movies, and to help individuals learn how best to care for them. This advocacy work has been successful there is increasing recognition of the importance of home movies as documents of social history. Several have been named to the National Film Registry by the Librarian of Congress. So perhaps the most famous home movie footage is the Zapruder film that captured the Kennedy assassination. There's also a set of films shot by Dave Tatsuno, shot illegally at the Topaz Relocation Center or Japanese American internment camp in Utah during World War II and then at the bottom, I'm showing you some images from a collection of films by Solomon Sir Jones, who was a reverend, an African-American reverend in Oklahoma, who made films documenting the prosperous African-American all-black towns in Oklahoma and Texas during the 1920s. 
It isn't difficult to convince most people that these films have historical value. But as a community of archivists working on home movies, one of the major challenges we face is how to make the case for the thousands upon thousands of home movies shot by non-famous people of everyday events. The question of volume is significant. How can this material dispersed across institutions and private collections across the country be preserved? At a 2010 summit called by the Center for Home Movies, archivists and scholars gathered to imagine what would be needed in order to undertake a mass digitization project involving home movies and video. We're still grappling with this question, and it mounts as we consider home movies made on more contemporary media, videotape, and then digital formats. In our current digital age, we generate and share a tremendous volume of still and moving images. The digital marketing agency Zephoria reports that on Facebook, there are photo uploads of 300 million per day. Every 60 seconds on Facebook, 136,000 photos are uploaded. The number of photos and videos uploaded on Instagram per day is over 100 million. More than 50 billion photos have been uploaded on Instagram since it was launched in 2010. Even if we could save all of this material, if we had the digital infrastructure for long-term and accessible storage, if we had a cultural shift to a kind of archival sensibility, what would we do with all of that material? And do we create all of these images with an explicit understanding that we want to preserve them, that we want to preserve them all? that we want them for ourselves or we want to share them with other people. I'm interested in how home movies teach us about what historian Peter Burke calls the social history of remembering. During the period of analog home movie making that I study between the 1920s and the 1970s, there were distinctive parameters on moving image practice. And as we all know, there are still raging debates about the value of digital technologies and whether or not they improve the quality of the image and the speed of production. What I'm focusing on is what we now refer to as pre-digital media, photochemical filmmaking, wherein, as you see examples here, a strip of transparent plastic film coated on one side with a light sensitive gelatin emulsion records a latent image which is then processed, that is bathed in chemicals to make the image visible. Before the so-called digital revolution, before the ostensibly democratizing affordability of videotape, analog home movie technologies on these formats limited the range of people who could make moving image memories, not to mention the scope and duration of activities that could be recorded and shared by those who had access to home movie cameras and projectors. So if we look at the history of formats that's narrated in these images, we can see a move from a theatrical gauge, 35 millimeter, to smaller gauges that were designed for non-theatrical film cultures. 16 millimeter introduced in 1923, then eight millimeter in 1932, and super eight millimeter in 1965. It's super because the sprocket holes are smaller, which gives you a bigger picture image, which you can kind of see in those last two examples. As these formats were introduced, they became cheaper. But what that meant is that there was a kind of spread from their accessibility by elites to the middle class. The medium comes with a range of economic limits. It's cost prohibitive. It comes with temporal limits. Each reel of film, let's say a five inch reel, 200 feet of eight millimeter film, shoots about 12 to 14 minutes, unlike the longer duration of videotape and this, you know, as much as our phones can handle. The exposure requirements were significant as well, it required a strong light source. Processing comes with a cost and a weight. They have uniqueness as physical objects. It's a far cry from the burst of photos that we can take on our handheld devices and then post and share. These economic and situational and technological constraints produce a different kind of intentionality in pre-digital filmmaking and a different sense of temporality. Consider the differences between shooting a roll of eight millimeter film and a video on a cell phone, between projecting a film on a screen in your basement and posting it on Facebook. 
The impulses for documentation and sharing may be similar. We want to capture people and places and things and moments. We want to remember individually and collectively. But celluloid means of recording, processing, and viewing is a slower and more selective, I would say a highly curated and staged mode of visual experience. The analog mode of production has a kind of singularity. So in the film stocks I showed you here with Super 8 millimeter film, the actual film that you run through the camera is what you would mail to Kodak and then get back. There's no negative involved. So each of these home movies is a singular document. There's also a kind of analog experience in viewing that requires a kind of seriality. You watch one reel at a time, one occasion at a time. It's a place-based viewing, and the physical space of the projector is where that viewing takes place. So here I would love to get a little feedback from you guys. How many of you are familiar with, you either shot or were shot by small gauge cameras? Yes, okay. Maybe your dad or your uncle shot these films. In our research, it's usually a male figure, but not always. This guy would pull out a camera at family events, maybe even shined a bright light in your face to get that exposure I was talking about, and instructed you to perform happiness. <laughs> As a middle class pastime, home movie making captures what one would expect of middle class lifestyles. I have a single family home, which features a basement, it might be tricked out for parties, I have a backyard for barbecues, there's a shiny car in the driveway, the latest appliances in the kitchen, I have a family that toddles and then graduates, gets the latest toys for birthdays and Christmases, I take them on vacations to Washington DC or the Grand Canyon, maybe Europe, and I also have a camera to record all of this activity and a projector to screen the films to friends and family in my house, maybe in the tricked out basement. The materiality of the films and of the viewing experience lends them a feeling of intimacy and particularity, my home, my family, my vacation. What makes them feel so authentic as recordings of memories is this individuality. But at the same time, these analog home movies constitute a broader cultural memory practice that is fundamentally collective and performative. So here's an image from uh, the Bud Billiken Day Parade, 1964. I'm gonna describe some of the work that I do with the Southside Home Movie Project. We connect with donors of footage to our project with a focus on personal archives. And there is a growing movement of people and services to preserve our personal archives, our both paper and analog materials, but also our born digital materials. But as we collect and present these to constitute a larger visual archive, one of the documents, one that documents everyday lives on Chicago's South Side from multiple perspectives, we get a composite view that calls our attention not just to the content of the films, but also their shared styles, their recurring tropes, and the types of memories and memory performances they activate on the part of donor families and other viewers. Now many people commend me on this project because of the way in which it demonstrates African American middle class life. It's an archive that doesn't exclusively focus on African American families, but that's a significant amount of the footage we have. And I accept all praise for increasing the visibility of black middle class lifestyles because we don't have enough of that in the media or in the historical record. But I'm also interested in how the selectivity imposed by home movie technologies that I just described might help us to understand how individual and collective memories are shaped and reshaped over time and in different contexts. This includes the performances and negotiations of memory that take place when personal materials like these are perceived to have historical value by their owners, by historians, documentary filmmakers, or public memory institutions like archives. So Anne gave a very nice description of what we do with the Southside Home Movie Project. We now have more than 400 reels uh, in the collection. 
And we have this online digital archive that provides access to most of our collection. I founded the project with two hopes in mind. The first was to explore an area of film studies beyond a focus on feature length commercial films, on genres and auteurs. As non-theatrical films, home movies point us to a vast but understudied realm of filmmaking and film exhibition that complicates the ways we think about issues of film authorship, style, and spectatorship. Films made for screenings in churches, in schools, community centers, and homes are being preserved and studied now by an international network of archives and scholars, enabling us to study how film cultures developed far beyond the walls of movie theaters and how films have been put to a range of cultural and political uses. So here's that Bud Billiken footage I had a still from before. We're about to see uh, tennis great Althea Gibson right there, riding down South Parkway, now King Drive. These spaces outside of movie theaters are really important to think about, and it gets to my second hope for the project, and that is, as a native Southsider, I have a deep curiosity about how Southside neighborhoods have changed over the years. I've been hearing a decline narrative about the South Side my whole life from my relatives. How 71st Street used to rival downtown, for example. So I was interested to see what kinds of documentation South Siders created of their own neighborhoods over these decades of boom and decline. And I was especially interested to know how people captured these things with cameras how their voices would inflect these histories, not those of scholars or journalists. I've realized over the course of my research that while there may be a dearth of primary materials about everyday life on the South Side in archives, there is a wealth of material in private hands, photographs, scrapbooks, journals, and home movies. If we look at them closely, we can see that these personal materials contain a wealth of evidence that is not replicated in other media nuances of cultural expression, from fashion to interior design, architecture, foodways, children's games, dance, as we see here, tourism, and much more. When we see these in moving images, the movement of fabrics, the uses of objects, the gestures exchanged among groups of people, even intimate gestures between siblings, for example, dance moves, Lots of types of camera performance, ranging from boldness to extreme shyness. Home movies are located on a historical continuum of self-representation. And when we consider them alongside snapshots and images captured by camcorders and cell phones later, we gain insights into how everyday visual practices reflect evolving senses of self and context. People making memories with home movie cameras on the South Side reflect particular milieu. Personal spheres, of course. Uh, homes are typically the setting. Community, family, and constellations of community even when people are on the road, say in vacation footage. They capture the South Side at a complex moment in its social history, the rigid segregation that characterized these neighborhoods and challenges to it and they are an, a representation of the black middle class. This class issue is central. Home movie milieu refers to a kind of social status. Home movies are a middle class technology, and it's really instructive to see how they document the development of Chicago's black middle class. So there's an interplay of memory, personal memory, south side location, and the politics of race and class that have been shaping and complicating this project from the beginning. So what I want to do is show you our digital archive and run a clip from the Reed family. Christmas morning is a very familiar theme in our collection. This is Christmas 1955. As you see, Mark and Philip get guns and Carol gets an ironing board. <laughs> The Reed family, Dr. George W. Reed, lived on Calumet Avenue in the Park Manor neighborhood. He was a nuclear scientist here at the University of Chicago in Argonne National Laboratory. So the person shooting this footage came to Chicago in 1945 to work on the Manhattan Project. His wife, Selena Reed, was a social worker at Bob's Roberts 
pediatric clinic here at the University of Chicago Hospital. The Reed family, as we see in their footage, navigate a really interesting set of racial worlds that maps out along generational, personal, and professional contours. So the footage includes, for example, picnics at Argonne Laboratories. This family attended Unitarian Church. The children went to the lab schools. So there were contexts of interracial sociality that characterized much of their lives. But as Mark, the taller of the boys here, recalls in his memoir, the Reed family could not live near campus when Dr. Reed first arrived at the University of Chicago. And this was true for many African-American faculty and students who came to the university prior to the civil rights movement, including the renowned social anthropologist and psychologist Allison Davis, who was hired here in 1942. The Davis family was told that the university was not responsible for what they said he called his personal happiness and social treatment, just his professional treatment. It's not surprising then that we also see in Dr. Reed's footage that the Reed family spent a significant amount of time as a family socializing with a circle of other black families. Uh, so some of the footage shows their vacation moments at Forest Beach in Michigan where there was an African American enclave and there were a number of such enclaves uh, in vacation communities. The Reed family uh, remarks in their oral history that they were moving back and forth between a white world, a black world, and an integrated setting, as you can see here at this picnic at Argonne. This stuff is so dangerous looking, it would never pass muster today. Okay. There's a slide that comes later that's absolutely terrifying. All right. As the project has evolved, it seems increasingly important to be conducting it here at the University of Chicago. Cited as it is on the south side, this university has a deeply conflicted relationship with its neighboring communities. It's still reconciling its participation in urban renewal activities of the 1950s, and the privilege that it signifies in many ways, its private policing, its Gothic architecture, that many outside of this university still find to be exclusionary. The Southside Home Movie Project consistently tries to acknowledge and address these tensions in the ways that we delve into the vernacular histories of the communities that surround this university. Reframe our work not as outreach, but as a respectful partnership. So, when donors contribute their films, we offer storage of the original fragile films in the university's climate-controlled film vault. We inspect, clean, and digitize the reels. This is one of our student interns. We provide donors with digital copies. We conduct oral histories, as Anne mentioned. And we invite our donors to speak at public screenings that take place in schools and libraries and community centers across the South Side. We do this not simply to extract information from our donors. And we don't simply try to interpret them from our expert positions. Rather, we see this as a collaborative project in which we invite the expertise of our donors and our audiences. The information we collect is not just for the benefit of academics, though hopefully it will be used by scholars, but also for use by a wide range of constituents, K through 12 teachers, students, artists, urban planners, community organizers, and others we have yet to imagine. The project aims to create spaces and resources for Southsiders past and present to reflect on their own histories in their own terms. When looking at the black middle class history documented in Southside home movies, we may not recognize that the images alone, we may not recognize from the images alone, the precarity of this social position. Showing off homes and gifts and travels and personal milestones, home movies of this period offer insights into the ways in which African Americans imagined and performed middle class identities. And this notion of performance is important. Black middle class subjects did not have equal salaries as their white counterparts. There are huge and ongoing gaps between black and white wealth. Members of the black middle class could not always rely on inheritances or their ability to pass on assets. As a group, they have a tenuous hold on hard-won middle class attainments 
that are exacerbated by ongoing racial discrimination and disparities. So the performative nature of middle class identity, how one dresses, manners, social circles, activities, included the making of home movies. So these movies were part of this middle class performance and they're also a tool for creating what I would call middle class memories. Watching Southside home movies with this trajectory of the black middle class in mind, we can see how they are both documentary and aspirational. They show off things and attainments and attempt to generate legacy material for the children who are so squarely at the center of these films. They're creating memories that can serve as tools for maintaining and surpassing the lifestyles provided by the parents. And this has always been a complicated legacy for the younger generations. And here I wanna share some words of the great Lorraine Hansberry. I don't have any Hansberry home movies, I wish I did. But she writes in her autobiographical reflections about her experience as a middle class black girl on the south side of Chicago in ways that capture some of the tensions that I'm describing. So Hansberry was of course the daughter of Carl Hansberry, a real estate, um, a major real estate figure on the south side who won a landmark Supreme Court ruling in 1940 opposing restrictive covenants in the Woodlawn neighborhood. Um, she talks about what home life was like in the 1930s on the south side when and I've heard this framed nostalgically for the most part, all black people lived in the same community across class lines, so laborers were next door to doctors. Her experience of this, though, has a different inflection in the way that she reports it. She says that at home she was taught that we were better than no one but infinitely superior to everyone, that we were the products of the most mistreated of the races of man, that there was nothing enormously difficult about life, that one succeeded as a matter of course. Now these contradictions are compounded by the ways in which she was read by community members as a rich girl, despite the fact that, as she puts it, her father had simply become a reasonably successful businessman of the middle class. So there's a chapter in her work, to be a posthumous work, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, called White Fur in the Middle of the Depression. It's a Christmas morning scene that I think encapsulates what must have been going on in some of the scenes that we see in our footage, but are not vocalized because that's not the space in which one could do that. She writes, upon opening this rabbit fur coat at the age of five, the grown-ups owed and awed around her. They congratulated the mother. They insisted that the outfit would be put on at once. They touched the fur and exclaimed afresh with passion. All the while, the child sat half ill with the outrage that had been committed against her Christmas. She was compelled to stand up, a small angry mannequin in her pajamas, while the coat was first lovingly shaken and thrust upon her frame and buttoned to her chin, quite as if she was about to go out into the cold. The muff was placed on her fists and the scratching little cap on her brow. She talks about being forced to model, looking at herself in the mirror, and then when she goes to school after the holidays in that coat, the same poorly equipped underfunded school in the black belt, which resonates with so much of what we could say about schools in Chicago, the South Side today, that the children of the ghetto had promptly set upon her with fist and inkwell. So the domestic scene that she describes um, captures some of the things that are left out of these films. It's the kind of content that actually shows up in a number of films made by white feminist filmmakers of the 1970s and 80s, and I'm thinking here of a film like Michelle Citron's Daughter Right, where they use home movies that show a kind of domestic bliss, but then narrate the undercurrents um, in those domestic situations. Sometimes, amateur filmmakers did capture, and very rarely, some of this um, kind of more troubling social dynamic and the disparities between the black middle class and the lower classes. So I'm sharing a reel here from the collection of Robert and Jean Patton, a couple from the Chatham neighborhood who gave us, a, we have a body of films that consist for the most part of vacations and family celebrations, but here uh, we found in a box that simply said riot, Footage of the aftermath of the rioting that took place on Chicago's west side in April of 1968 after the assassination of Martin Luther King. I'm gonna skip ahead a bit because 
In addition to, obviously, the physical damage that Robert Patton captures, we also can see here the way in which residents of the West Side attempt to continue to live their everyday lives. And then at the very end of this reel, we were shocked to discover that there was footage of the Wall of Respect. This is the landmark collective mural that was created on 43rd and Langley two years um, earlier by the Organization of Black American Culture. This celebration of black heroes in arts, sports, and politics became a central platform for performance and community organizing, a space for practicing the tenets of the black arts movement. And we've confirmed with historians who've been working on this material, Romy Crawford and Rebecca Zorak, that this is extremely rare footage um, of the wall of respect. So I don't know that uh, this was intentionally put together, but the way in which Robert Patton's reel highlights the simultaneity of these spaces on the south and west sides, I think gives us an unusually direct representation of how black people, the range of ways that black people in Chicago responded to disfranchisement, redlining, police brutality, and municipal neglect. When I started this project, I did not know that my own family had home movies, but my cousin gave me some reels shot by her father, Charles Merrifield, a mailman, and I found my mom doing the Watusi <laughs> at the age of 16. We've shown this film at lots of family gatherings, and very recently as we were watching it, she casually mentioned that the outfit she's wearing was a hand-me-down, not from one of her sisters, but it belonged to the daughter of her mother's employer, Ben Rothberg, owner of the Blue Band Laundry on the far north side of Chicago. So I don't know if Arlene Rothberg ever imagined that her skirt would be moving like that all the way down on 92nd and Harvard in Princeton Park. Let's look at that again, yeah. <laughs> For me, this skirt signals some of the complex dynamics of interracial, inter-ethnic relations in Chicago. I think, for example, about the succession that took place in neighborhoods like South Shore, the uncomfortable and sometimes violent turnover that took place as African Americans moved into historically white controlled schools and stores and political machinery. This skirt is a reminder that this is an intimate history. Now I haven't pushed her on why she was so slow to share this detail, but I think it stems from the discomfort of the reminder of these hand-me-down fashions. And it is a kind of um, uh, also a reminder of that these films are a repository and activator of memories in this case, hierarchical racial relationships that we have to think about when we're excavating this footage. All right, so we just rolled out a projector into the middle of the aisle. And I'd like to screen for you one of the reels from our collection from the Patton family here. So that's the original reel and here's our digitized footage. This is Jean Patton in her amazing kitchen <laughs> with her amazing gold pants on 84th and Prairie, right, Guion? Yes. Guion Foreman is here, Jean Patton's great nephew. Jean Patton was uh, an educator. She was a teacher at the McDade School for almost 20 years. And she very stylishly plays this game of solitaire. Every day. Every day, huh? Anything you want to say, Guion? Do we have a microphone for him? Uh, so the, the appliances changed a little bit, not a lot. <laughs> but this is pretty much every day in her house. You know, everyday life. Isn't that fabulous? I mean, the sink matches the and this this segment is about the kitchen this is one of the things that I find to be so important about the footage I mean she's there but really we're showing off the 
the decor, right? So she fought with my great uncle, Robert. We call him Bob, Uncle Bob. She wanted this new kitchen. So my guess is she got dressed up to show off the new kitchen. <laughs> Gion, tell us about your great uncle. Uh, Bob Patton, he was a um, state trooper. He was the first black captain of the uh, Illinois State Police, but really anywhere in the United States, he was the first black captain. He was also an expert marksman. Yep, expert marksman, made his own bullets down in the basement. Um, you know, like had guns like John Wayne, you know, <laughs> won all of the, the competitions. That, in fact, the uh, Illinois State Police, one of the shooting ranges that they have is named after him. So this is my mom's first cousins. Uh, yeah, that's Cole Park right on uh, King Drive at like maybe 85th Street, 84th Street. Mm -hmm. So that's Uncle Hoppy, Uncle Mike, <laughs> and they're still kind of goofy and clowns even today. <laughs> That's Uncle Mike. <laughs> and Gion, the block that your family lived on, at some point you had so many relatives on that block. It was a white block. Yeah, all white neighborhood and then um, a house came up for sale and my aunt and uncle, they bought that one and then white people started to move out. So every time another house came up for sale, another relative would buy it. So uh, on that one block, Aunt Jean lived there, Uncle Wayman, Uncle Wesley, Aunt Mary, and then my grandmother lived maybe about two blocks away. Mm. And then later when they started having kids, those kids also started buying houses on the block. So pretty much half the block was all family. Like when I was a little kid, you could just open the door, just walk up and open the door and go in anybody's yeah. house pretty much on the block. That's Uncle Bob right there. He was a big guy, maybe about 6'5". You wouldn't want to be pulled over by him on 57, probably. <laughs> it has never occurred to me to sit down to iron. I don't know why. <laughs> he's, a, he's a genius. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip ahead um, to a sequence. Look at that. That's my mom. Yeah, your mom. Okay. This might be my favorite segment of all of our films. Um, it really demonstrates how sometimes these home movie makers would not just document stuff, but they had some artistic pretensions. <laughs> <laughs> so they're making this trick film, kind of Melies style trick film. Slow motion. You have a fun family, Gian. Always. They involve everyone, you know? <laughs> Even folks who might be a little small for the trick. <laughs> and somebody even smaller. This is just incredible. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. We can uh, bring the lights back up. Thank you, Gion. Thank you so much. Okay. So this is what happens at Home Movie Day. So Home Movie Day, yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, part of what we try to do at the Home Movie Project is not just show these films, but really think carefully about how we describe them. As an archival project, we think seriously about the histories and the memories that are attached to them. So in this spirit, we have created a digital archive that doesn't just impose existing cataloging standards on our collections, but rather we think about how the content of home movies requires unique and extensive descriptive practices. So that's why we interview the families. We record any information that's on the boxes or the reels. And we have student research assistants who read the images on a granular level to generate a range of subject headings like costumes, cooking, courtship, cruises, just to name some of the C's. We hold community cataloging events in which we invite community residents to gather in small groups and go through the footage with us 
to find the kinds of things that they find to be striking or interesting in the footage. And this is one we did last year at the Logan Center. We've been doing them more recently, our uh, student intern Ashley Trueheart here, at Mather's More Than a Cafe in Chatham over on 83rd Street. What we're hoping to do with this dimension of the project is to have users contribute to the catalog so that they can find the things that they are looking for. At our screenings, we encourage people to talk to engage in collective vocal interpretation of the details of everyday life pictured in these amateur films. Home movies have what I would call multi-vocal qualities. And so this is the last, I'll talk over this. This is a necessarily kind of messy, maybe even chaotic aspect of our archival methodology. The information we get is always partial, often contradictory, and it reminds us that we have to be open to the partial and the contradictory in our archival and historical work because it depends so heavily on memory. So this is another re of, uh, reel from the Reed family, the nuclear physicist. For me, this is a really stunning example of how archival footage can contain elements that seem to be incidental or accidental. So we have some moments like this in the archive where probably accidentally someone shot footage and then put the same reel of film in and shot it again. So you have a double exposure. Rather than read this only as an amateur mistake, I think some insights can be gained from this kind of shooting on a stylistic level. This visual overlay of activities calls our attention to differences and redundancies in movements, expressions, how people perform their ages, their genders, their relative places in communal circles. This double exposed footage powerfully evokes a duality between family and community celebration on the one hand, and the sometimes oppressive expectations of performing happiness like the young mothers we see here on the other. Being open to the incidental includes having sometimes difficult conversations with donors about who should have and use this footage and for what purposes, about whose memories will represent those of the family. It means making broad invitations to the filmmakers and families, other community members and others to participate in making sense of these images. So I just want to share a couple of images by way of conclusion of our recent events that we've held. This is um, an exhibition that took place at Art and Arts and Public Life's um, uh, Arts Incubator over on 55th and Prairie. It was an exhibition that took place last summer called Everyday Resistance, The Art of Living in Black Chicago. And as you can see, the curators made the space look like a living room mid-century living room, and we had screenings taking place uh, on the walls. There were public programs associated with this um, exhibition, including one on parks as contested spaces, on social dance, and on South Side Sisterhood, where participants reflected on gender and youth culture as experienced in their upbringing here. We expanded this South Side Sisterhood program with support from the Illinois Humanities Council in a program that we held in May at the Logan Center. We went through our archive to find scenes of sisters and invited the now grown women to reflect on their childhoods and the role that sisterhood has played in their lives. We also invited members of Global Girls, a performing arts organization for young African American women in Greater Grand Crossing. The young women shared their perspectives as girls today and their insights into contemporary modes of self-representation. And then we had small group discussion about these topics at tables. We had over 100 attendees at this event. The young women talked about the impact of social media on their lives, how it functioned as a kind of um, mode of expression, but also was isolating, preventing the kind of interpersonal relationships that the older women talked about as so formative in their lives. It was a really special event. The home movies offered something to the girls, seeking tools for connection, for surviving and thriving. The films were a vehicle for the women to remember and reflect honestly about how they have navigated the intersections of gender, race, and class in their own lives and struggles. And viewing them in this group setting connected them to a larger intergenerational group. This Southside Sisters program is just one example of the ways in which performances of memory in and in dialogue with old home movies can push, push far beyond nostalgia. They can open up new, sometimes unexpected points of entry into history. And they offer the kind of equipment for living that we can use now and in the future. Thank you.